All right, everybody, welcome back to the IDE seminar. Uh, we are very pleased today to have Sonia Jaffe with us, uh, Senior Research Economist at Microsoft, um, to talk about a study that is hot off the press, um, recently published and has been getting a tremendous amount of media attention. Um, her co-authors are listed there and she's gonna take you through it, but uh, we're also uh, very pleased to see some of our own family and friends there, uh, Dave Holtz, um, Sid Suri and others uh, along with Sonia on this research. Uh, it's a fantastic piece of work. We're all dying to understand how the new normal of working is going to translate um, in terms of collaboration, uh, how remote work affects collaboration. Um, and this is a particularly careful piece of research uh, that uses um, rigorous methods to really get at the causal effects rather than report survey responses necessarily or just rely on correlation. And so with that, I really uh, appreciate, Sonia, your effort and your team's effort to nail these things down for us, really important questions. And I will just remind everyone to please turn off your uh, videos and to mute your microphones so as to minimize interference to post your uh, questions to the chat. And if there's something that I see as uh, immediately relevant, I'll kind of break in and Sonia said that that would be okay with her. And then for more discussion, we will uh, reserve to the end. So with that, I will turn it over to Sonia. I will turn my camera off as well, Sonia. Welcome and uh, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks uh, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Dave, if he's not already on the call, should be joining uh, soon. Obviously uh, familiar to this group. And I think my colleague uh, Langchi is also here. Um, and this is a uh, joint work with some uh, other folks at Microsoft as well. Um, and so I want to start off by saying uh, that I'm, this is just uh, us presenting our research. We're not uh, representing Microsoft uh, in any way. And um, so I gave a kind of a, a bit of the, the the motivation, right? Like this is very much in the zeitgeist. There's a, there's a reason uh, that it got a lot of press. Uh, remote work uh, has been become much more common during COVID-19. Um, the estimate is that prior to COVID, less than five percent of people were working from home uh, more than three days a week, um, and at least at some point during the pandemic, uh, over a third of Americans were were working from home full time. So a pretty dramatic shift. And there's an expectation that a lot of this change is gonna continue post COVID. I don't know about folks on the call, but a lot of tech companies have announced some form of longer term, permanent or longer term uh, remote work. And even companies that are not doing permanent remote work and wanting people back in the office, that there's an expectation that, uh, that, that, that there's been a dramatic shift, that it's gonna be more hybrid going forward, that people have figured out how to do some amount of remote work and that they're not going to just go back to commuting into an office five days a week. Um, Nick Bloom, who uh, at Stanford, who's done a lot of work on remote work even prior to the pandemic, predicts that knowledge workers will work remotely about 20% uh, of the time going forward. But to kind of inform these policy decisions and think about how to, how to make this work long term, we need to understand the effects of remote work itself, not uh, as Simon said, the, the correlations um, and the just survey responses, observed trends, we, we want to get at the, the causal effects. So um, we started out with this, this question of what is the effect of remote work on collaboration workers, um, I'm sorry, on information workers, collaboration and communication patterns, full stop. So not during a pandemic, well, like independent of the effects of the pandemic. And then we also get into how to, um, how do these effects vary for different types of workers and try and look at how much of the effect is due to kind of the direct effect. If, if I work remotely, what does that affect on me uh, versus pure effects? So if I work remotely, what is the effect on my collaborators? So how do we do this? How do we take the changes that we observe, um, just kind of looking pre-COVID to February, 2020 to April, 2020, we observe from change and we wanna break that down into the changes that were due to school closures and lockdowns and a lot of uh, business uncertainty and new demands coming from the pandemic. 
separate that all out from the change due specifically to people switching working remotely, because that's the part that we think is going to persist long term. And so that's the part that's relevant for these the policy decisions that firms are making. And so we use a, a difference in difference approach, um, which is a fairly common economics technique where you say, okay, we've got two groups of people. In this case, it's those who are working from home or working remotely prior to the pandemic and those who are working in the office prior to the pandemic. And we say, okay, we have a control group and we can look at how they changed at some point in time. Um, and in our case, so people who are already working remotely, whatever change we observe when the work from home mandate happened at the start of the pandemic, that's the change due to, to other factors other than remote work because they were already working remotely. And so then we take the people who had been working in the office and start working remotely. They have a different change and we say, okay, well, part of that is due to these other factors and the remainder is due to remote work. So we're using the people who were working remotely prior to the pandemic as kind of a control group for uh, all the other changes in order to figure out the treatment and the treatment group. And then the second piece, as I mentioned, is uh, wanting to think about this both in terms of direct effects of I switch, uh, an individual switches to remote work and uh, spillover or indirect or network effects of when someone's collaborators switch to remote work. So this is the uh, estimating equation that kind of allows us to do that. So we have individual level fixed effects. So this is saying people are different. We don't want the fact that maybe uh, the people who work in the office have the type of jobs where they have more meetings to affect our estimation. So we're gonna control for the individual, uh, kind of their, their average level before and after. That we're gonna have time fixed effects because there was a lot happening in spring of 2020 and we don't wanna attribute all of the changes that we saw to uh, remote work. And then we're gonna have our first uh, kind of effective interest. So D is a, a dummy variable for like, were you someone who was fo first forced to work from remotely during period T? And Delta is that, that ego, that a direct effect on the individual. And then we also have the, the indirect effect for um, did your, what was your change in the share of your collaborators who are working remotely? Um, and how did that affect? We're gonna look at whatever outcome we're looking at. And then as is standard, we, we have a, an error term. Um, and so some of this is, is pretty standard for difference and differences, right? You're assuming added a separability between the time and the group effects. Um, some of it is not standard, right? This, this peer effects is not in your, your standard basic uh, difference and difference model. And the kind of additional assumption going into to using COVID as our, um, as our treatment is the assumption that the effect of COVID is additively separable from uh, these other effects that we're looking at. Um, in order to weaken the assumptions we need to make to, to support this model a little bit, we also use uh, coarsened exact matching. Um, so the idea is that rather than needing to assume that the treatment and control groups would have um, evolved in parallel absent the pandemic, we just need to observe, assume that conditional unobservable so uh, we, we reweight the, um, the control group to, to look more like the treatment group. So based on role, managerial status, seniority level, and tenure at Microsoft, um, we, we weight folks um, in the control group in order to have the kind of same distribution of all of those things in the control and the, the treatment group. So then we only need to assume that conditional on all of those things, a person's uh, outcomes would have, would have evolved the same um, in, the, in the treatment and control, control group if the treatment group had not switched to remote work. Um, and then as an additional robustness check, we also do a version where we match on the outcome variables. Um, and this is, this is following um, some work Suzanne and, and Kahlo authors have done where because um, our treatment and control group basically had different treatments in the pre-period, we don't match on outcome variables in the pre-period, which is kind of the standard way of doing that we match on outcome variables in, the, in June, 2020. Um, because if we were looking at people who kind of had the same level of meetings when some of them were working remotely and some of them were working in the office, then that's not a way of looking at people who we think are the same. We need to look at the people who, when they were all working in the same environment, had the same 
number of meetings a week in order to, to look at people who are observationally the same. So we do all this um, using data from workplace analytics, um, which is basically uh, for Microsoft US employees. Um, and we have a bit of a pre-period starting in December, 2019, and then we go through June, 2020. Um, and workplace analytics basically kind of reports on how much people are, how and how much people are using Teams and, and Outlook. So it's the telemetry and the metadata, not looking at any individual emails or the content of IMs, but just um, how many meetings, how many meeting hours, how much time spent sending IMs and emails. Um, and it's all anonymized. Um, and we're, we're not able to report the, the baseline levels of all of these things, of how many uh, hours someone is spending in meetings a week or how many uh, emails they're sending. And so we, we normalize all of the data by the average February value for that variable. Um, and so everything I show you will be reported in terms of February values. Um, and so we're gonna do this analysis for a few different types of outcomes, stuff around the network structure and network dynamics, and then also looking at the use of different communication media. Um, starting with the network outcomes, uh, we turn to the literature for why uh, different aspects of network structure and, and dynamics um, are going to matter for the, the ultimate outcomes that we care about. Um, so we look at bridging ties, so ties between people um, from otherwise disconnected parts of the network, um, because there's evidence that uh, people with structurally diverse networks have access to more novel and, and less redundant information. Uh, we look at strong and weak ties, so the ties that people are spending uh, more or less of their collaboration time with, because it's known while strong ties um, can make it easier to, to transfer information because of the, the trust and, and um, reciprocity there, weak ties both require less time and energy to maintain and can provide access to more novel information similar to the, the bridging ties. Um, and then we also, so that's kind of within a given network. We also look at the network dynamics. So month to month, uh, the ties that go dormant or are dropped and then the ties that are added or uh, rejuvenated. And um, again, relying on the literature that shows that network churn is correlated with individual outcomes and that there's individual benefits to adding new or um, dormant, uh, like reconnecting with dormant ties. Um, so how do we operationalize this? We think about a collaboration network among Microsoft employees um, constructed based on the set of colleagues with whom uh, each worker communicates. And so we have monthly level data. Each node is an employee and there's an edge between two employees if they had a meaningful interaction through at least two uh, modes of communication, email, IM, scheduled meetings and unscheduled calls in that month. Um, where a meaningful interaction is an interaction with a uh, group size of eight or less. So the idea is if uh, two people were both in like a bi-weekly all hands with 100 people in that month, they're not automatically considered connected or collaborators in that month. You have to have um, interactions versus via two different types of media and they have to be with a relatively small group of people of eight or less so that we think that you're actually interacting with that person and not just like on some massive email thread or, or large meeting. Um, so given those definitions of nodes and edges, um, we count just the number of connections that a person has. And then we also look at the cross group connections based on the org chart. So here a group is a, usually less than 10 employees. They share a manager and kind of a common purpose within the company. And we look at the number of kind of distinct groups that an individual is connected to, and then also just the number of cross-group ties that they have, right? It may be going to, to people in the same group, but ties to people other than in their own group. Um, we look at, at, at bridging connections specifically, those ties um, that, to people who are not connected to the other people that a person is connected to. And then we also look at the individual clustering coefficient. So here it's saying, given your degree, there's a certain number of connected triads you could be part of. Right, you've got seven connections. You can think about all the different pairs and look at whether they're connected. So the, the individual clustering coefficient is the share of potential triads of a group of three people who are all connected to each other that you have given the number you could have 
uh, with your degree. So those are the kind of network structure variables. Um, and then we also look at um, the share of time that you're spending with using those structure variables to define kind of groups, your, your, your bridging ties, your weak ties, your, um, your, your cross group ties, your bridging ties, your added ties. Um, what is the share of time of your collaboration time that you're spending with each of those? And that's just kind of counting the number of uh, meeting hours, time spent on email and IM you have with each person and uh, dividing by the total to, to get a share with each of your ties and then adding across all the ties in the group. So your, your group of bridging ties, maybe you're spending 10% of your collaboration time with those, with those ties. So those are the network outcomes. Um, and um, I'm not gonna show you parallel trends graphs for the dozen network outcomes, but uh, for one, <laughs> for the bridging ties, we can look kind of prior to the work from home mandate that started in March, 2020. Um, and the top graph here shows both the uh, treatment and control group. So those who were working in the office previously and those who had been uh, remote the whole time. Uh, and they, they're moving in parallel. And then this is for that uh, second variable that we're looking at, the effect of collaborators. We take kind of the, the top and the bottom of people who had less than 10% of their collaborators were remote prior to COVID and people with more than 50%. And again, seeing that prior to COVID, they're, they're moving in parallel. Um, and then when the work from home mandate, uh, work from home mandate starts in March, 2020, uh, there's a deviation. But again, after the, the mandate there again, um, seem to be moving pretty much in parallel. Um, so that's, uh, there's no way to like truly test the parallel trans, trans assumption, right? Because the assumption is that absent COVID, they would have continued to move in parallel. So we can't test that with the data, but this provides some supporting evidence uh, for that assumption. Uh, so what do we find? Uh, first, we find no effect on the number of connections that a person has, the number of collaborators. But when we look at specific groups of connections, we find a 0.07 decrease in the number of groups that a person is connected to, and a 0.04 decrease in the, the number of cross-group ties. So we can think of this as like the, the, there's a drop that corresponded to 7% of the, the number of tie of the number of uh, groups they were connected to in February on average. Um, there was that, 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 that's the amount that it dropped uh, during COVID. And then these are the number of ties. And when we look at the share of time spent with those ties, the effect is even more dramatic. So there's some negative effect on people's ability to, to form these connections cross group, but it seems like the, the real, the bulk of the effect is in um, the amount of time they feel they can invest in those relationships or the amount of times they, they end up investing in those relationships because there it's it's drops by uh, over a quarter. Similarly, um, if we ignore the, the org chart and just look at what ties are bridging groups according to the existing uh, collaboration network, that also drops with remote work by 0.09 of the, the February value. And again, the effect on the, the share of time spent with them uh, is even larger. There's a 41% uh, drop in that. And the, the clustering coefficient that is kind of going in the other direction, right? Like more bridging ties means less siloed network, higher uh, clustering of coefficient means a more siloed or kind of more interconnections within the silos. So um, the increase in the clustering coefficient is saying where we're dropping ties across group and we're adding ties within, a, within the groups that exist within the collaboration network, not the, the org groups necessarily, but the, the organic groups that have formed in the collaboration network. Um, and then this last piece here, which I could not figure out how to show via a little infographic diagram, um, is the uh, network dynamics. So um, there's a decrease in both the number of churn ties, the number of um, ties that become inactive or dormant month to month, and also a decrease in the number of added ties, the number of new ties that someone was not talking to in the, the previous month. And this could either be dormant ties they're reconnecting with or totally uh, new ties that they're adding. Um, and again, the effect is larger if you look at the share of time spent with those ties. So 
some statistically significant effect on number of ties that are new or cross group, but substantial effect on the share of collaboration time spent with those uh, weaker or new ties. Oh, sorry, just so just to reiterate the, the real takeaway here, and this, this is showing all of the those estimated effects with their, their standard errors, um, is that networks are becoming both more siloed, groups are less interconnected and more intra-connected within themselves and less dynamic. So those are the effects that we found on uh, networks. Um, and so we're all, next gonna look at how people are using different communication media, right? Because uh, we have data on email media, scheduled meetings and unscheduled calls. And again, relying on the literature to say that kind of both media richness theory and media synchronicity theory think that the, the form of communication matters for people's ability to convey different types of information and converge on, on meaning um, in different scenarios. And so um, most of these definitions are, are pretty standard, scheduled meeting hours, if it was on your calendar in Teams or Outlook and you're talking to at least one other person, those are scheduled meeting hours. Unscheduled call hours are Teams calls that were not on your call hours. People just spontaneously said like, maybe they sent an IM first, maybe they just pressed call. Um, and then email sent uh, is only work account, but through, through Outlook, IM sent is through Microsoft Team. Work week hours is, um, one that's a little trickier. Um, we look, we sum across all the days in the work week, but the, the time between the first activity and the last activity of the day, where activity is those other four things of uh, I am email, unscheduled call, or scheduled meeting. Um, so this is, we, we can't measure um, how much people are truly working. Um, this is kind of the span of the time that work, we, that work takes up in their day. So I just wanted to, to flag that. Um, and again, the parallel trends charts uh, for unscheduled call hours also look pretty good in terms of um, moving pretty much in parallel prior to the pandemic and also after the transition period. And uh, the other thing noted on these graphs is that we do have weekly hours for these variables as opposed to the network variables, which are all um, at the monthly level. So what do we find? Um, so well, we do see a, a jump in unscheduled call hours, the baseline for that was very low. Um, and so we see a drop in both scheduled meetings and if we sum together the unscheduled calls and the scheduled meetings, um, overall there is a drop in synchronous communication of about 5% or 0.05 of the, the February value. Um, on the other hand, if we look at asynchronous communication, um, emails went up by 0.08 and IMs went up by 0.51. So a big uh, jump also in both IMs and unscheduled calls. Again, the unscheduled calls were at a very low level. And one thing to, to flag here is that there are interactions, like this is the change in the interactions that the, that the technology captures, right? Interactions um, that are either happening through Teams or were put on someone's Outlook calendar. So prior to the pandemic, there may have been synchronous interactions where someone went and stuck their head in someone else's office and said, hey, can I ask you a question? And they chatted for 20 minutes. And that's not in the data. Um, now, if they said, send them an email saying, hey, can we chat about this thing and put 15 minutes on their calendar, that would be in the data. Um, but so there's a, in, in, the, in the unscheduled interactions category, we think that there's a moderate amount of interaction that was not being captured. Uh, pre-pandemic. And so this increase has a bit of an asterisk next to it because we know that went to zero, right? When everyone started working remotely, no one was stopping by each other's office or desk anymore. Um, and so this may just be a shift of interactions from ones that we weren't capturing to ones that we were capturing. Um, but that means that this is kind of a, a uh, the, the drop was at least this big, right? The actual drop in synchronous interaction was probably larger than this because all of those interactions that we aren't capturing went away. Um, 
So that's why we we don't like, yes, this is a big number, but we don't want to make too much of that because we think that that's largely just starting to capture interactions that we weren't capturing previously. Um, and then lastly, we also find um, uh, a moderate increase in the uh, work week duration or work week span. Um, again, people might not actually be working more, they might just have kind of spread their work over a longer section of the day. Um, and even if they are working more, it's not um, enough to explain this, this increase in communication levels. Um, and in some ways it makes the, the drop in synchronous communication all the more noteworthy. So those are the, the average effects across um, all the, the US employees that we look at. We, we try and look a bit at uh, heterogeneous effects. So one cut that we do is managers and individual contributors, right? So somebody who has people reporting to them and people who don't have people reporting to them. Um, and we don't see any systematic differences for the network variables, but for the communication variables, it seems like remote work is causing managers to uh, communicate more. Right, the, the increases in IMs and in unscheduled calls are larger, uh, also emails, and so and the so the, the decrease that they don't see a decrease in um, synchronous communication, and they see larger increases in asynchronous communication. And then uh, so that's kind of people. It, it's it's somewhat seniority in terms of people higher up in the org chart, but it's also kind of the type of work that they do, of whether how much of their work is kind of that coordination. Uh, across employees and their teams versus just kind of work that where you're doing tasks on your own. So maybe not surprising that the, the, the managers were the ones that really uh, needed to find better substitutes for, for in-person, or maybe not better, but more substitutes for in-person interaction. And then the other cut that we do is people in, in, in professions that are tagged as engineering versus non-engineering. Um, and we see uh, a similar pattern here where engineers um, see a bit more of uh, an increase in uh, communication than non-engineers. Um, so that, it, that was the heterogeneous effects across different types of people. I also wanna to return to this ego and collaborators effects that I talked about in setting up the model. Um, we have these two different effects of firm wide remote work of the effect on the individual and the effect um, on their collaborators. And so we can actually break out the total effect that I was talking about into the, the two different pieces. Um, and the main takeaway here is that there really are substantial effects on collaborators, right? This is not like, oh, if I switch to remote, it has a big effect on me and maybe a little bit of effect on other people. Like it, it varies from variable to variable, but you can see for some of these, like the, the collaborator effect is substantially larger than the ego effect, or at least as large for most of them. And so we think that this is really important in terms of thinking about um, mixed modes, like companies that are gonna have some people in the office and some people remote, or even just like thinking about the effect of remote work in other situations of if you um, just randomly send some, even if you had a, a random experiment where some people were working remotely, and some people were in the office, if you just compare the two groups, if, they, if they're on the same teams and working together, then you're gonna miss uh, some of the total effect if you, if you ignore these, these spillovers. Um, and the same is true for communication media, um, that there's substantial uh, collaborator effects in addition to the, the direct effect on the, the individuals themselves. Um, so to summarize, and then I, I see that there's a few questions in the chat, though I can't read them while presenting, so I'm, I'm eager to, to uh, get to what, what, what interests people the most. Um, but just to summarize, we find that um, when separated from the effects of the pandemic, remote work caused collaborations to be, collaboration networks to become more siloed and less dynamic, caused people to spend less time with their weak ties, um, and to shift to more asynchronous communication. Um, and if these challenges with remote work are unaddressed, this could potentially lead to less people having less access to novel information, which matters for innovation, um, less knowledge transfer, um, and kind of the, the less rich communication media can, can have uh, negative effects on, on work quality. Um, and we don't have any direct effects, but we 
posit or we think that this is likely to also um, have potential to impact productivity. Um, and so the, the real takeaways are that uh, with remote work, we think that, that firms need to uh, try really actively to foster those weak and cross-group ties, um, create opportunities for people to make those ties and uh, figure out ways to um, facilitate or incentivize people investing in those, those ties. Um, we can also suggest that tools for better asynchronous collaboration will be particularly valuable uh, to remote workers or to companies that have a lot of remote workers. Um, as I mentioned, it means that firms cannot just compare remote and on-site employees. Um, we can't just do kind of the, the raw difference because of the substantial spillover effects. We're also very aware that the, the long-term effects may differ from the, the short-term ones, right? Um, and it could go in either direction, right? You can imagine that uh, in the period we're looking for at the beginning of work from home, people were really relying on the social capital that they built pre-pandemic. And so they weren't as negatively affected by remote work because they had those relationships and they still had those, those ties. And that as it goes on, uh, things could actually get worse. Um, but you could imagine going in the other direction. You could be like, we all started working from home. No one knew how to do it right. They kind of let their weak ties atrophy. And then they realized, oh, I, okay, this is going to be going on for a while. I need to invest in my network and make sure that I'm not just talking to the people in my working group and that I'm maintaining those connections to know what's happening across the company. Um, and it's possible that uh, in the medium or longer term, a, uh, a lot of these challenges were ameliorated by uh, individual actions. Um, the other uh, long-term, short-term difference is just think, effects on things like innovation. You're just not going to see in the in the short term. Um, we don't. I mean, we don't have <laughs> measuring innovation in general is difficult. Is difficult, but particularly in the short term of like how successful was that brainstorming session? We, now that's uh, very difficult to measure, and certainly not in in our data, or I think pretty much any data that folks are looking at. Um, in terms of policies going forward, I think um, mixed mode where. Some people are remote and some people are in person. We would expect to kind of have a lot of these same challenges more or less proportional to the, the fraction of people who are working remotely. Um, and not just for those working remotely, but also for their collaborators in the office. Um, the implications for, for hybrid, I think, are, are um, more nuanced, right? If people can spend their two days in the office uh, connecting with folks and building relationships and building cross-group ties, um, then it's possible that a hybrid where everyone's only in the office two days a week could, from these dimensions, look exactly like uh, in office work. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of uh, open questions uh, there going forward. Um, so that is all I have in terms of specific content to present, but I'm eager to uh, hear folks' questions and, and uh, jump into it. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Sonia. This is fantastic. And we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I looks like our first question, um, I'll just have people um, kind of unmute if they did like and, and ask their questions. The first one's from Daniel about, um, about the data. So do you want to come unmute and ask that question, Daniel? Sure. Um, thanks for the great paper and the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, the data just came from Teams, Outlook, etc. But you did not include any um, Yammer, SharePoint, Git, DevOps, or whatever other channels of communication that are, let's say, more one-to-many than uh, direct one-to-one. -one. Um, yes, that is correct. Um, it's funny. I feel like the question, the version of this question I usually get is like, "What about Slack?" and uh, um, which within Microsoft is, is less of an issue, but um, those are obviously all the ones you mentioned are ones that are actually used uh, within Microsoft. Um, and part of that is just a, a data availability. Um, I think there is some um, motivation or justification in terms of, as you said, like it, it's not just the one to many, but it's like kind of the directed communication, right? Like you don't, build relation, I think I think it's much more difficult to build relationships with people by like posting something out into the ether for folks to read rather than like sending it to specific people. Um, so yeah. I, I think I think that, I think there's tons of interesting questions to be asked about how uh, 
use of those of those platforms changed with remote work. Don't get me wrong, um, but you're right that we're not looking at those. Yeah, maybe I'm biased because we launched Yammer in February 2020, and we moved it up now to 100k users, uh, which is a different channel than, of course. Um, but it's an interesting um, avenue yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I think it would be very the fact that it only launched in February 2020 would make it very difficult to do this style analysis with Yammer. Um, we did look a bit at um, like some of the, um, I'm not sure if it's DevOps, but some of the like kind of um, code commit database, like data on just like mm -hmm. when people were, um, and there, we just didn't have any precision. It's just very noisy metrics because it's something like big commits don't like happen that often. And anyway, we, we, we tried, we did try yeah. that, um, yeah. and we're not able to, to get past the noise. What's interesting, maybe just to add on, on that, because um, I, I've seen the data, um, the number of chat communications for us in Teams is still um, growing from month to month, but the number of channel uh, chats is, has stayed constant over the last 18 months almost, which okay. I find kind of weird. Um, I, I I understand it in a way, but I also don't understand it. Cool. Yeah, I, I don't think I have uh, anything to, to add on that one. No, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. So we have another question about um, the results um, from P. Klein. Do you want to unmute ask your question? or I can, I can just read it. It says, so when reviewing the results, the big surprise or what seems counterintuitive is how synchronous meeting time could go down when Zoom seems ubiquitous. ubiquitous. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but can you um, kind of just explain this a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that the, the main insight that, I mean, we have kind of, the paper has the, the observational trends and the, they're, is kind of this average increase in um, scheduled meeting time. I mean, it, it may be, I, I, we don't use Zoom internally. Um, so, so one of the things is kind of this distinction between unscheduled and scheduled, and I don't, maybe Zoom doesn't have that as much. Um, but I think the, the big thing is that we, we do see an increase in um, scheduled meeting time if you look at the raw observational data. And the, the insight from this paper, from, from doing the causal analysis, instead of just looking at the, the raw time trends, is that um, the control group, people who were already working remotely, saw that same increase in uh, synchronous collaboration time. And so our method basically attributes that not to remote work, but to kind of the general, uh, mayhem of 2020 of um right like azure and teams both saw huge surges in demand and there were teams that were like doing a lot of work to to, to address those um and also uh the lockdowns i mean we, we i mentioned the stretching of the workday, and i think that for um at least for some people particularly those without kids at home uh there was kind of nothing else to do and so there were folks who ended up uh, doing more work and but again and, but again we it happened in both the control group and the treatment group and so it was not an effect of remote work specifically but kind of an effect of, of the time um so then we have another more specific question from david about the results um uh do you want to unmute and ask your question david yeah hi thanks Z. um yeah, in, in looking at the results, I'm just trying to understand if, you know, a 4% or 7% or 9% or 26% change is like ridiculously large um, or, and or is there any other exogenous um, variable that's happened previously that, that would give us some feel for the magnitude of these, these numbers? I, th I mean, the perception is that they're large, but uh, how large are they? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I don't have any like kind of benchmark uh, changes to share with you. Um, I 
I guess my sense is that the the four percent, the seven percent, the nine percent are are like are not huge, are not something you necessarily want to ignore. But I don't think of those as as being huge. I mean, if I think about, I, I don't, I've, I've, I have no idea how many ties I have in a month, but it's probably like forty or fifty, and so then I'm dropping like two. That that doesn't feel huge. Um, but it also like doesn't maybe isn't irrelevant. I, I think the share of time ones are the ones that I think are really substantial, right? Like if you're going from spending 20 or 30% of your time to with cross group ties, like going from 30% to 22% of your time with, with cross group ties, that feels pretty substantial to me. Um, so I don't have any benchmarks for you. Maybe that interpretation helps a little bit. Sonia, can I jump in on that? Um, sure. Uh, just a question, because share of time, of course, it depends on how much time you track. Um, did you see a, um, a significant increase in time you track online in, in the two time frames? Um, so was there really a shift, or is it just you track more time and thus maybe the same amount of time shared with weak ties just becomes a smaller fraction? Yeah, so the, there is some increase um, because, and we think that that is largely because we're capturing lots of stuff that we weren't capturing before, right? Yeah. It used to be you would chat with someone over lunch and we weren't capturing that. And now you have that lunch call as a, as a team's meeting and we're, we're capturing it. Um, and so you're right that like the, the, the denominator did go up, but I guess I think, unless you, you think that, um, that the the shift, the stuff we weren't capturing was much larger for the the strong and in-group ties than for the cross and weak, uh, the weak and cross-group ties. I think that this is still real, right? Because the, the, the weak cross-group ties, like all of the in-person interaction went away there too. Um, and so that's why we think that that, that drop in the, the share of time um, mm. is, still, is still pretty substantial. Um, it, David, it looks like you also had a question. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll through the chat. You also had a question about the um, correlation. Yeah, cor cor any correlation or causality to, to performance. Uh, and you pointed to some other literature, related literature, but uh, I'm just curious about what your gut tells you about um, productivity performance or any other metric you might think of related to work. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, we did try and look at some measures of output that are a little bit more directly connected to productivity, um, but they're, they, were, they were the measures themselves which just have too much variance for us to, to be able, and, and um, they were limited to engineers um, where we don't have as many people who are working remotely prior to the pandemic. Um, and so we weren't able to find anything there. So we're, uh, yeah, relying on the kind of the literature I mean, the, well, I think both the literature and my gut say that uh, these probably matter, um, that we weren't just talking to those people in other groups uh, for fun prior to the <laughs> pandemic, but that those matter to, to uh, us being effective at our jobs. Um, but using, your, using yourself as a data point of one, do, do you think that your productivity and performance has stayed the same, increased or decreased in the last 18 months? Um, I think that uh, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, I think that um, a lot of people on my team and, and my t the, the team that I work on at Microsoft is very like outwardly oriented. We meet more with people on other teams, like in normal times on other teams than in our, within our own group. Um, and it, particularly in the first few months, I think we struggled uh, to make those connections and, and uh, maintain those relationships and, and stay relevant. Um, I think it's... Uh, gotten somewhat better. I also, I mean, my data is not consistent with these patterns because I started uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Microsoft started this big um, initiative to study remote work. Um, and I got very involved with that. And I've been working with a lot of people on other teams who I hadn't met, uh, had, hadn't worked, uh, uh, Long Chi and I had not worked together prior to the pandemic. So I have added um, new ties and more cross group ties. Um, so in that, in that respect, um, I'm also not, not your modal data point here. 
And then we have a couple of great questions from Carlos. Do you want to unmute um, some kind of meta questions and then kind of a more specific question about, um, about Teams? Um, I mean, okay. I can, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, um, my question, it, it is not related to, to what you have done, but uh, some, uh, some work that you may uh, pursue in, in future, uh, and the, mainly the, the the corporate culture that you and uh, it is not a variable. Obviously, you you are uh, analyzing in the in the context of uh, of Microsoft. But suppose that if if it if it was in another uh, uh, company, um, do you think that the corporate co uh, corporate culture will, would influence? The, the results. This is one question. The other, it is not only the the, the corporate culture, but also the national culture. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are great questions. Um, I th absolutely think it matters. I mean, to some extent, the fact that we found these effects at Microsoft, like I think Microsoft was as well set up as most almost any company. I mean, I guess there's a few companies that were full remote prior to the pandemic, but like. Microsoft is pretty well set up for remote work, given that we produce tools for remote work. Um, and so you can imagine that without kind of that culture of, of using Teams and stuff prior to the pandemic, uh, things would have been even harder. Um, but I also think there's huge um, influences of company culture around uh, like, are you encouraged to spend time uh, connecting with folks across the company who, are not like immediately relevant to this specific project that you're working on, but that help you like see the bigger picture and, and maybe useful next time you're brainstorming and be like, oh, I can ask this person about that thing. Um, so I do think that there's definitely a role for company culture. Um, and I would guess that uh, kind of national culture as well. I, I don't, um, we, we're only using US employees. So it's definitely not something we've looked at at all. Um, I think that one data point to throw out there is um, when the Microsoft China offices, unrelated to this project, but other work that I've looked at, uh, or other work from this initiative I mentioned, when the Microsoft China offices opened last summer, um, we were actually surprised at the extent to which people were going back. Um, and even, I mean, they were still mostly uh, working from their desks because there was still a pandemic. So they like they would have meetings with other people who were in the office and most of it would still be via Teams. Um, and I think that that was partially, like there's a lot of cultural aspects to how well remote work works, right? That's partially about like, how much space do you have at home and how many people are you sharing your space with? Um, and that's not speaking directly to the outcomes we're looking at in terms of ties and, and different communi communication media, but in terms of the effectiveness of remote work is, is hugely important. And then I think it's also just like how much emphasis the cultural places on in-person interaction and like that FaceTime aspect, um, I think can, can really vary across cultures. And it's something that I think a lot of companies who want to be more remote work friendly are needing to put a lot of thought into right now, right? Like this is, this was when everyone was remote. If you, if you now have some people back in the office, how do you make sure that uh, the people who are working remotely are not being left out? Uh, May I have an, another question? Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, um, um, for example, the features of the, the teams evolve. I think that there was a, an important uh, evolution in the, in, in the teams. And during this period, there are lots of uh, features that were added. And in what extent the, those features, this new future, also influence the, the, the way uh, that uh, um, people interact with others? Uh, yeah, yeah, that. Teams has been um, evolving a lot. Um, two things on that. One is that we're only using data through June 2020. Um, I think a lot of the new features in Teams have come out since then. I think for the first few months of the pandemic, Teams was pretty focused on like meeting the dramatic surge in demand. Um, and then the second thing is we would just have to assume that those new features affect the people who were remote prior to the pandemic in the same way that they affect the people who uh, were switching to be remote. Um, that, that's what we would need to for, for these results to go through if there was su substantial effect of, of new features. Thank you.
Um, so it looks like we have gone, gotten to the questions in the chat, unless. Um, yeah, I know the, the, one, the, the one question about a, uh, like the untracked in-person communication, which I, I touched on briefly. And, and I, I think that we, in that context, we're very much just taking our results as, as a bound, right? Like we, we, we know the direction of that. We know that in-person untracked communication went down. Um, and so we can say like the decreases we find are kind of lower bounds, the decrease, it could have decreased more. The increases we find are, are upper bounds. Uh, maybe it, the actual increase was less. Um, it looks like there's also a hand up. Hi, uh, yes. So uh, I just wanted to follow up with this question. Maybe you've already addressed it earlier. I just came a bit late. But is there an attempt to sort of track these changes for a longer period of time? Because I know you mentioned the data set ends at June 2020. So I would imagine a lot of adaptations occurred within the workforce for the last year or so since the ending of that data set. Is there like a project, ongoing project of trying to track how your results are sort of going to evolve over time? Yeah, I mean, we have not um, looked at that. But, I mean, the, the data is, is, is there. I think part of the challenge is also like this type of analysis requires a balanced panel. So like we don't look at anybody who joined. Like one question we get a lot is, is so like what about onboarding and, and new people joining? And like we, we can't speak to that at all because we're not looking at people who joined the company. Um, after the, the pandemic. Um, and that that narrow focus becomes less and less reasonable the longer the time span that you're looking at, um, right? Because I mean, Microsoft's hired thousands of people um, since the pandemic. Um, so I don't think we have plans to um, kind of expand this specific analysis to, to more recent timeframes, but um, it's definitely something. I mean, the, the general questions are all things people are continuing to think about. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I, can we, I guess, do a silent or unmuted round of applause for um, this was a really awesome presentation and obviously really super relevant um, to all of us here on our seminar on Zoom. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so next week we'll be having um, another presentation by uh, Sarah Banna and it will be at this time. So um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Sonia, again for, for the presentation and um, hope everybody has a great Thursday. Yeah, thanks for our, all the questions and thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sonia. Bye-bye.